Let's see. So I'd like to call this the October 19th meeting of the Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board to order. Uh, please uh, let me confirm that the open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the Arlington Redevelopment Board is convening by Zoom as posted in the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by recording. So first, permit me to confirm that all members of the Redevelopment Board are present and can hear me. I'll take roll, roll call to confirm. Uh, Ken? Yes. Eugene? Present. David? Present. Katie? Present. And Rachel, I am here as well. Uh, and our staff members who are joining us tonight are Jenny? Here. And I believe Erin is joining us tonight as well. Here. Great. Do we have any other staff joining us this evening? Great. No, we do not. Great. Thank you, Jenny. So I'd like to open the first item on our agenda, which is docket number 3633-1500 Mass Ave. This is a continued public hearing for uh, to review the application filed on July 27th, 2020 by 1500 Mass Ave LLC at 1500 Mass Ave in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, Section 11, and the Town of Arlington Zoning Bylaws. Uh, do we have, uh, who do we have representing the uh, applicant tonight? We have Robert Anessi presenting, and accompanied, accompanied by Monty French, the architect, Emily Driscoll, the designer, and Darren Danucci, one of the developers. Wonderful. Would you like to start, Attorney Anessi? Yes. <coughs> Great. Actually, I'm sorry, before I have you kick off, Jenny, did you have anything that you would like to add from a staff perspective? Apologies. Anything further to add? Uh, okay. Just how uh, this proposal has been updated based upon my memorandum to the board. Wonderful. And I think we'll hear more from the applicant. I know there are some questions about those materials, so we'll, we'll get to that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jenny. All right, Attorney Nessie, please continue. Yes. Apologies. Uh, as you know, we had a hearing with respect to this matter some time ago, some weeks ago, and uh, we had a lot of comments, and I had the distinct impression uh, that the proposal we had was not uh, received very nicely or greatly by the board, uh, and so we went back to the drawing board ourselves, okay? And we essentially started from scratch. But what we, what we did was we took into account all of, or most of the comments of the members of the board at the last hearing. Uh, we basically have redesigned the building uh, almost entirely. And as you can see from uh, the uh, plan of the site plan that uh, we have, uh, the uh, uh, setback with respect to the uh, a building from Massachusetts Avenue is very close to the lot line on Mass Ave. And I need to point out to the members of the board that that is not unusual for uh, Massachusetts Avenue. And it certainly is not unusual for this area of Mass Ave. And as you go down Massachusetts Avenue, uh, traveling in an, a, a, an easterly direction, uh, uh, you're going to see even some of the residential houses are very close to the lot line on the other side of Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, you g uh, get to Arlington Heights, that business district, uh, and of course everything is on the lot line there. You get beyond that and even the residential buildings on the 
other side of Mass Ave, heading down uh, again in an easterly, uh, easterly direction, are very close to that front lot line. Matter of fact, you get to my building, which is at 1171 Mass Ave, and I think that's the first distinctive uh, 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 building with a substantial setback. So I point that out uh, with respect to the way we've designed our plan to show that our plan uh, is not incompatible with what's happening on Mass Ave, what's been happening over the years on Mass Ave. Uh, we think that uh, it's compatible with the desired uh, streetscape for Massachusetts Avenue, and uh, Monte French is gonna speak about that when he talks about the design of the building. Uh, we basically comply with most of the zoning uh, uh, regulations. Uh, uh, in, the uh, in the redesign of the building, we have created a 10-foot side yard uh, on the easterly side of the lot. Uh, we comply with a 10-foot side yard on the left side. We comply with the rear yard, 20-foot side uh, 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 rear yard. Uh, uh, in the back as well. Uh, we comply with FAR, uh, and if there's any question on that, Monty French and Emily Driscoll will be happy to respond to that. Uh, we also comply with open space. Now, one of the matters that was brought up at the last uh, hearing was, again, we're talking a mixed-use building. And one of the issues that came up was whether, in fact, the size, uh, the square feet of the office space we're going to have would be uh, something that would be marketable uh, in terms of the town. I had the opportunity, I didn't do a, a, a full-blown market research because uh, quite frankly, I didn't have the sample to do that. But what I did do is I spoke with one of the well-versed real estate brokers in town, Robert Bowles. Now, you may recall that we did, and the ARB did, the building at 925 Mass Ave back months ago, uh, more than a year ago, I guess, at this point, uh, and that building uh, converted into residential and an office use. There's an office use in that building that has approximately 500 square feet. That rented for $1,250. Our uh, office space is being proposed at 475 square feet. And I'm given to understand in speaking with Mr. Bose that the rent we could get for that office space would be approximately $1,000 per month. So we think that it is a viable uh, proposal to have that kind of office space in the building. We are, of course, proposing uh, two levels of residential use uh, above. Uh, we don't exceed the 35 uh, height requirement. Uh, and each of the two levels above will be two bedrooms. Uh, we're, we're also proposing, as we discussed last time, and we were invited, I think, and suggested to look into the possibility of having an accessible unit. So we have included an accessible unit in our proposal. I'm going to reiterate what I said at the last hearing with respect to an affordable housing unit. We cannot do an affordable housing unit. As much as that might be suggested by any member or members of the ARB, the economics do not work out. This project has been uh, in the works for more than a year. Uh, my client has been carrying the building for more than a year. COVID has not helped uh, in terms of uh, the delay uh, and the economic costs involved in putting up a building on the site would uh, simply indicate that we could not do an affordable housing unit. Now, one of the issues that uh, uh, in addition to the setback uh, issue that uh, we'd be asking for relief from the board uh, for, and again, the board does have the ability to give us setback relief. We know that. Uh, we've been educated on that by Doug Heim Town Council, who did a memo on the hotel project and indicated that you can, in fact, uh, the ARB 
does have the ability to grant relief with respect to setback. Uh, we also will need relief with regard to parking. Uh, and uh, well, essentially, we have five parking space, but, uh, spaces, but we need eight. We don't need a parking space for the commercial space because it's under 3,000 square feet, but we need five parking spaces. I have indicated in the memo submitted to the board that we can satisfy two of the criteria for getting uh, relief under the Transportation Management Act. One is covered bicycle uh, parking and shared bicycle parking. Uh, I think as we discussed last time, carpooling is probably not a viable option with respect to my coming up with a third criteria. So that would be a matter that I would be asking the board to give us some relief on. So the board is going to say to me, well, what are you, what are you going to give us in return? Uh, well, we, I can't give you much in return uh, because the space is tight to begin with. Uh, again, we can't do affordable housing. What we have done in designing the project is uh, been very sensitive to the abutter out back. As you may know, there's a very, very high wall at the back of the lot. We are not going to do anything in terms of, uh, you know, significant blasting of any kind that is going to disturb the neighbor out back. We're going to, in fact, be a good neighbor. Uh, so I'm asking the board to take that into account uh, with respect to any consideration they can give my client with respect to relief. Uh, with, with regard to the proposal itself, I think I'd like to have Monte talk about that. But uh, my, uh, my point to the members of the ARB is, this proposal, I, I believe, is a good proposal for the site. It's a good proposal for the town. It creates more residential housing, which the town needs, which, which the master plan calls for, which the governor has called for as well. And it does comply with the mixed use component of the bylaw. It may not give one or more members of the ARB as much commercial space as they would like, but we're doing the best we can uh, with the economics as far as the, uh, the site is concerned and with the development. So with that, I'd like to have Monty jump in and uh, just, uh, describe for you the plans uh, as far as the, devel uh, the developer is concerned. Monty? Thank you, Bob. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, we are taking a look at the plans as submitted uh, last meeting um, and all the comments that were made on the plans. And I don't know if we can put those back up. Jay? Sorry. Thank you. Um, so what we'd like to do is go through the way this was originally conceived in the previous meeting and where we're at now. I think that there were several comments, as Bob mentioned, um, regarding um, site access for vehicles, um, where some of the utility spaces were, how the rear yard was treated, uh, some screening issues, uh, accessible units on ground floor, commercial spaces, and so on and so forth. I think that we've dealt with a great deal of great number of these uh, comments that were brought up in the last meeting and we'll just kind of go through uh, what we've done here. So what we've done is we propose that the building be moved forward and closer to the left side as you see it here on the page and that's in order to address the one curb cut two lane access to the rear of the lot for parking. Previously we had a through lot uh, access, one cur curb cut on one side and another curb cut on the other side. Uh, so that was uh, our way of addressing that issue. Um, we also think that it was in keeping with, as Bob said, some of the kind of urban design uh, ideas that I think are present in the planning guidelines for Arlington and also just what is currently in the city and having the building pulled forward which I think creates more of a, I guess, liveliness along the sidewalk. Uh, and then allows us to maintain some of the green space at the rear 
the trees along the rear also maintain uh, the screening that we had discussed in the previous uh, meeting. Those have been placed on the site as required. Um, and then the parking spaces, as Bob mentioned, we have five parking spaces, the two lane access. And then along the rear, there's our access to the enclosed bike spaces, the trash and the mechanical space. Um, at the front of the building is where we have, on the left side is where we have the accessible unit. Uh, and on the right side is where the, the office space will be or commercial space. So the accessible unit will be accessed through the stairwell where all the tenants will be accessing the building. Uh, the front porch will be closed off so it's not entered through the sidewalk. We wanna try and keep people who might think that that might be a commercial space from trying to enter through that point. So we closed it off and made it a private space. Whereas on the other side, uh, the commercial space is accessed from the sidewalk. And once we get to the elevations, you'll see that we revised the signage uh, to address that point and also made sure the signage follows the guidelines uh, that are spelled out in the ordinances. Um, as we move up in the building, none of the plans have changed in terms of unit layout. Uh, they all remain the same. Um, we did, I think you might have seen the note down below, we did address the other comment about having the sprinkler pump on the first floor underneath the stair. We have the shaft that's at the rear of the stairs here in this plan. You can see that it'll be used to route any plumbing from the first floor up through the building. And then as you work up to the building to the roof plan, if we keep moving down, thank you. The same, yeah, the third floor is the same plan. And then the roof. So at the roof, you'll see we have the screening system around the mechanical. I think that was another point that we talked about last time. And then as you move down towards the streetscape there, that's how the front of the building has been revised to offer this fascia that the signage would be located along. So we have office space signage, and there's a blown up detail later in the drawings that dimension that, and then the address of the building. Again, this is just side elevation that shows access to the side yard. Most likely this will need to be a step that goes up into the rear yard uh, so that we have rear yard access for maintenance. And if we keep going down, that's the elevation along the rear of the building where the access to the bike room, mechanical room and trash room is at adjacent to the parking. And then this is the section along the drive lane that we added with the one curb cut. And then to the rear is the, is the, would be the parking. And then this is an overall site section that shows the adjacency of the building to the rear abutter. Uh, and then there's, you know, in our presentation material, we provide a more illustrative section that shows the trees and how they provide the buffer between the visual buffer between the rear butter and our property. This sheet uh, points out some of the details that are required for the uh, bicycle parking and off to the left on the sheet is the details for the signage. You want me to bring up the the other renderings? The yeah, presentation board? Yes, please. Okay. So you can see here, we've, this, this is an updated rendering of the front of the building along the streetscape. Uh, we think that act, actually adds a little more liveliness uh, and along the streetscape. Um, and again, the one, the single curb cut to the left there. The lower left image you can see is the site section that's more of a rendered view of how this would be represented. Uh, the parking versus the, the trees at the rear, the rear butter in our building and that whole visual buffer that occurs there. Um, more updated renderings of the front of the building versus existing conditions. 
the plans which we've already gone through some of the details of the bike rack and things like that that you're familiar with in our other submissions and then we did talk about plantings uh, these are some of the the proposed pavers that will be used at the front of the building and some of the plantings that will be are proposed for the front of the building So I think that, you know, for us, I, I feel like we, you know, I, I we feel really strongly and, and actually excited about the move of, of the building. Um, we feel like it it's actually made the project better. So, you know, the comments were really good. I think it drove us to a better project. Uh, it looks, it, I think it'll look handsome along the streetscape. There's a lot of moves and a lot of work that had to go into place to get this to work over here. Um, as Bob mentioned, we only have five parking spaces, but um, you know we, we did try to look at getting more in there, but this is kind of maxing it out in terms of just how the site is accessed uh, and, and circulation and things like that. Um, I think that that's pretty much it for the revision of the design based on comments from the last meeting. Um, be more than happy to answer any questions if you all have any. If we've missed anything that was brought up at the last meeting that uh, any one of the members wants to bring to, to our attention, that, that would be appreciated as well. And we'll try to address that uh, also. Great, thank you, Bob and Monty, I appreciate it. And um, I just wanted to start with one question and um, one comment before I turn it over to my, to my colleagues. Um, I guess I'll start by saying how, how much I appreciate the thoroughness of this revised uh, presentation, especially with the, the section showing the abutter um, and the siting of the, the building itself. I do have a question about the access to the uh, usable open space. Um, I think Monty, you had started to mention that that uh, would be through steps, I believe, through the side yard, but I. I would like to make sure that that is in fact usable space. Uh, that was part of our, our commentary there. So if you could just address that, that would be helpful. Thank you, yes. Um, I think we missed that there will need to be some stairs along the side yard that get up into the rear uh, green space, yes. Okay, great. And then um, my comment is actually something that I wanted to throw out there before um, for, for some of my colleagues to discuss. Um, so when we looked at this presentation last time, I, I believe, Ken, you had made a comment about a requirement for um, an accessible unit, and um, we, we had a little bit of chance to, to take a look at what number of units actually triggers a requirement for an accessible unit, which I believe is greater than four. Um, rather than four units triggering mm -hmm. that requirement. So um, as I look at this revised proposal and especially looking at the front elevation, I would actually much prefer for the entire first floor to be commercial space to be considered mixed use. And given the, the equal treatment of the, um, of the facade at both the proposed residential unit and the office space, it, nothing distinguishes one use from, from the other. Um, I think that um, having both entrances along Mass Ave access uh, office use space is much preferred in my opinion. Um, so reverting to the, the four units, given that an accessible unit would not be required, would be my preference. I think it would also address some of the parking relief that you're asking for as well. Um, but I just wanted to throw out that comment again, um, just a comment for us to discuss as a, as a board as well. So Ken, I'll throw it out to you first. Well, I'm gonna say, I, I'm gonna respectfully disagree with you, uh, Rachel. Uh, I believe the codes say four or more units will we, we will require that one of those units uh, will need to be uh, accessible. And uh, I think that's, um, we can leave that uh, for the co-enforcement uh, in, uh, um, in Arlington uh, to determine that. 
I mean, if I am wrong, I, uh, and, and uh, I don't think I am, but if I am, having to, uh, all the ground floor being uh, office is fine. But I believe uh, once you become, uh, w once you have four or more units, it's considered multifamily, no longer residential. And, so, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'd actually just want to pass that over to Jenny because she did have a chance to speak with the building inspector today. I'd asked her the same question, Ken. Sure. What did uh, what did Mike say, Jenny? Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yes, Mike uh, Byrne, the director of inspectional services and building inspector, confirmed that CMR 5.21 section 9.3 which we were um, referencing at the last meeting, that is related to five or more units. Uh, this does not have an elevator. It is a three-story building, and it's only when you add the fifth unit that you have to comply. Another example would be, we've, we've permitted other projects where there have been four units and they didn't have an accessible unit. It's the fifth unit that triggers um, the compliance with 521. So um, I, that is the message back to answer this question. Uh, well, if that's what Mike says, then I will um, bow to the enforcement authority for that, and I, I'm okay with that. Um, can I continue with my comments, please, Rachel? Please, or absolutely, please do. Okay, uh, I too want to echo the uh, comment on how, how thoughtful and uh, well uh, presented this is. It's a good change of pace that we've been seeing. And um, I, I, I really like, uh, I think uh, Monty, you did a good job. <clears throat> it's a very handsome building. Who, who, who's <coughs> well, um, okay. huh? I like the fact that now we have uh, one yeah. curb cut moving the, moving the driveway away from the corner of the, uh, of the street, uh, moving the building closer to the uh, Mass Ave, activating the street. I think I agree with you that I think that makes the building uh, much more attractive. If you look at this elevation and um, and the other elevation, uh, existing one was just two big garage doors up a driveway. I think this looks much nicer. Um, yeah, that's right there. I think if you compare this uh, this new building with that old building there, this is more interactive. It's much it's it's more complementary of the of the streetscape, and uh, you did a good job there. Um, I do have uh, one question. Well, I have a couple. One is on the front elevations. You you saw uh, double hung windows, uh, four over four. On the side and rear elevations, you you show casement windows. Uh, it kind of looks like you know one's sort of a modern building more, and the, and the front looks more of a traditional building. Is that something you just just um, in a rush to get this done, didn't look at that enough? Or do you guys want to keep the casement windows on a, on the side and rear? Um, on the side, I don't think, can we go to the side elevation? I'm not familiar with what you're... Yeah, let me go back. Uh, you go back to the elevations, uh, Jenny, if you can. I think that you have to forgive me, Ken. I, I now I know what you're talking about. I believe that that's a remnant from the last iteration. That it, it's actually a sliding glass door. We used to have the balconies over there. No, I mean, on your new drawings you show, they're right not here. balcony doors. They're actually casement windows. Okay. And we'll, we'll, front, we'll revise those to to double hung. We'll make it more consistent, and then yeah, we won't we won't have the inconsistency there. I like the front windows. They, you know, they're 404 kiss double yep. long windows, and the other ones, you know. And if you look at, the, can we go to the side elevation, Jenny? <coughs> if you can just add a couple more vertical pieces of trim just to break up that. Um, long bands of um, hardy panel, um, I think it'd be uh, much appreciated too. You know, you maybe okay. bracket the, um, um, the windows. Okay. So, you know, just get a little more excitement. All they look like right now is punched openings in a, in a field of uh, siding, you know? 
definitely no problem I mean, I think your front looks really nice, and I think you should give it, you know, I don't need the depth and shadow lines, but if you just have a little uh, vertical trim piece, that's, I think that's all I really need to look at. Okay. Um, on the two top units, are these condos or rentals? Uh, I believe they're going to be rentals. Okay. Um, were there any possibility of maybe uh, putting a, a roof deck up there? Um, we have not discussed that. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I can't speak to that because I don't want to offer up something that could cost more money. I'm not sure if that's in the, in the budget. Okay. I mean, I think the money that you can, uh, for the return for that may happen. Okay. Where it's just the two top units having a spiral staircase up with a, you know, a hatch mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a little deck there. So that for each, and they, those are private, not public. So you don't have to get an right. elevator or any of that kind of stuff up there and it makes the two top units like penthouse units you know right something might uh, for consideration i'm not you know saying it's a requirement it's just a consideration yeah it's excellent and then um is that box up there enough for all your equipment or will the will it be bigger uh usually the city multi-systems can the the condenser for one of those can fit in a screening system like that uh, okay. We've done, we just did a building in Back Bay that had a similar sized unit. It's a city multi condenser that uh, can handle multiple the heads. All right. And then I'm assuming there must be a roof hatch up there from the uh, uh, stairs. On the yeah, third. there'll need to be a roof hatch access from the stairwell. Okay. And it looks like there's plenty of room and uh, no shadow lines if, we, if you guys ever decide to go with some solar panels, right? Yeah, I mean, if that fits within their construction budget, that would be a, certainly a, a prime spot for it. Okay, and then um, you seem to be missing some civil drawings. Um, the only thing that um, I'm looking for and, you know, is uh, get approval from the city is um, some aerial drains or trench drain at the end of the driveway. Mm -hmm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to slope down a little bit. I just don't want water spilling into the sidewalk. Okay. Um, besides those things, yeah, I, I think it's a very nice building. Um, you you, you will put fencing up on that wall, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, there'll need to be a guardrail and things like that. You have to, you know, there are some things that we'll need to button up. We were trying to work through this. As you can see, there was a lot of changes that we went through and trying to get. No, this, you guys did a, did a very system. good job at, at doing that. Um, just you know, you might want to look at what that railing might look like. It's not going to be like right. a chain link fence or anything, right? I'm, the quality of work you're doing here is not like that. No, 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 certainly not. Um, that's all I have for now, Rachel. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate it. And I also appreciate you raising the question about the accessible unit before. I think it was good for us to go through the exercise of, of reviewing that requirement. So thank you again. Um, okay, uh, David. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so uh, I would also like to say I appreciate um, that uh, you all have been responsive to many of the comments from our last meeting. Um, I shared, uh, looking at this, the, the concern about uh, the accessible unit um, for a few reasons. Um, one is uh, there was no detail in here showing the actual layout of either the accessible unit or, or the office space, particularly plumbing. And it wasn't clear to me, given the small sizes of of those spaces that uh, they actually could be uh, built out in a reasonable way uh, to meet those those purposes, but I, I think that's that's maybe a moot point um, because um, uh, I I also share the concern that um, as much as it would be nice to have an accessible unit, I, I think that takes us. Uh, a little bit too far away from um, from the mixed use intention. Um, so I, I would agree with my 
colleagues uh, that I, I think uh, that would be better off being office space than, than trying to squeeze an accessible unit in there. Um, I wanted to ask, um, we at the last meeting had some discussion about um, the deviations from the tree plan uh, where additional trees had been removed. And I wanted to ask uh, where, where things stood on that and has there been further discussion with the tree warden and is there a resolution? As far as I know, uh, Bob Hennessy, as far as I know, uh, the letter that we submitted to uh, the board, uh, I believe Jenny has a copy of it from the tree warden, is the last operative statement with respect to trees. And that basically uh, indicated that we were going to be taking down eight trees, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Monte. Uh, and that we were going to be replacing uh, eight trees. Uh, the, uh, there was a tree plan submitted with that uh, letter that went to the, uh, to the tree warden as well. Uh, but uh, there's been no further discussion about that. Uh, we felt that uh, it would be better to come before uh, the ARB, uh, see what their thoughts were with respect to uh, landscaping, trees, etc. cetera. Uh, although we do know that the tree warden will, would be the one that would have to be satisfied. Uh, but at least we'd have uh, uh, feedback from the ARB on that issue. So we know what we have to do. It's a question of where it's going to take place on the site. Right, well, thank you, Mr. Nessie. It, it was my understanding that uh, more than eight trees had been removed from the site and, and that was, was kind of the heart of the issue. If that's the case uh, and more have been removed, uh, I'm sure the tree warden is going to revisit that. And if that's the case, then we would wind up replacing more than the eight trees. All right. So okay. along those lines, um, one of the new renderings uh, that shows the rear retaining wall and its relationship to the property behind this building uh, shows uh, a number of mat mature trees providing uh, screening between the property behind and, and the new building. And do those, do those mature trees still exist? Are they still on the property? Monte? Uh, this is Monte French. No, they're not. It is part of the proposed tree plan to plant new trees back there. You know, of course, they'll have to go through some growth to reach a certain height, but the proposal is that ultimately we would provide planting trees along there that would also provide the screening. But not- Watson, I've just learned that it is 11 trees, not eight trees. My mistake. That have been removed? Pardon me? 11 that have been removed. Yes, yes. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd like to be sure that, uh, there's a resolution to that situation, um, before I would feel comfortable moving forward here. Um, I don't want to feel like, uh, we are, uh, we are permitting a project where there's uh, a question of whether uh, the approved tree plan has been followed or not. And it apparently hasn't. Um, if I could. And I, we, uh, we, can we, I we make did. a suggestion, Mr. Watson? With respect to the uh, tree plan, can we leave that as a condition subsequent to whatever the board may decide this evening, uh, so that if we can get a consensus, we can move to uh, a vote. 
uh, and uh, had the condition subsequent being that the uh, petitioner has to, in fact, satisfy the tree warden. Uh, we do know it's 11 trees, okay, and not eight trees. There was a prior uh, letter from the tree warden that it hit, it indicated eight, but that subsequently got changed to 11. Uh, but again, I would suggest that in the interest of, again, my clients have been working on this uh, project for an, an awfully long time, I would suggest that if we could leave that as a condition subsequent to the tree warden, that uh, perhaps we could move ahead with the project. I'm I'm open to discussing uh, what my colleagues think about that, but I have to say that I'm I'm somewhat disturbed uh, by uh, the fact that uh, that mature trees that were not supposed to be removed have been removed and can't be replaced in a mature state anyway, uh, and. Uh, and basically we're, we're being asked to, uh, to let that go. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think if, if, uh, if the tree warden, if there's, if there's a resolution with the tree warden, um, then um, that's something we would take into consideration, but I'm, I'm disturbed by that, um, that that happened hey, and that, yeah. David, this is Monty. Um, sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt anyone, uh, but I don't want this to go too much further. We were in communication with our client and he did have a discussion with the tree warden and did update his letter with the tree warden. It is, is documented that there will be 11 trees. Um, and we did show, the plan that we show shows 11 trees. So there was a conversation about that and making sure that that's what was going back in. Um, I don't know. It looks like the, the most current letter is not on the file here, but 11 trees is what's documented with the tree board now. Okay. All right. I can, I'll, actually, I'll... I can pull that up. I'm sorry to interrupt, David. Um, I can pull up that letter. It's actually in a different document. So I, I pulled up the old letter. I apologize for that, for the confusion. Um, if you want me to pull up the other letter, I can. Um, also, we are looking at the plan that shows that those that number of trees. Right. Uh, whatever and your it, wishes are. I mean, I'll 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 move on, uh, and if if any of my colleagues want to discuss this further, I'll I'll let them. Um, with respect to the TDM plan, I mean, really the only component that uh, you're currently uh, proposing to. Uh, to satisfy is is the bicycle parking, which uh, you do show on the plan, and I, I appreciate the creation of of the bike room, uh, and uh, that certainly that and the short term parking in front certainly meet the requirements of of the bylaw, but I, I think in terms of um, um, of whether that's sufficient to merit a parking reduction, uh, as you mentioned, I, I do want more. Um, and i am like to suggest a couple of possible additions to your TDM plan that could help. Uh, and I don't know if my colleagues have additional ideas, but um, one would be subsidizing MBTA passes for the residents. Um, and uh, the other would be charging for parking, um, distinct from, from the rent of, of the units. Um, and both of those are, are possibilities that are listed in the, in the TDM section of the bylaw. Um, and, uh, you know, given the nature of this proposed building, I, I don't know that any other, any of the other suggested TDM provisions are really applicable. Um, you know, the office space is not going to be very large, so I don't think it's likely you're going to be able to put a shower in there for employees, but um, I, I think there are at least a couple of reasonable possibilities in there that you could add to the TDM plan 
and I'm open to other suggestions from my colleagues. Um, that, that was all I had right now. Thank you, David. Uh, Jean? Uh, thank you. And um, I agree with my colleagues that I think this is a um, much better proposal than the one we saw the last time. I liked pulling it up toward the sidewalk. I think it, as other people said, makes a much better streetscape. It's sort of consistent with the commercial building on one side of it. Um, and uh, I think that would be good. And as uh, Attorney Inessi pointed out, we do have the ability under the bylaws to um, allow a smaller setback uh, than otherwise required. Um, I also agree with my colleagues that the first floor should be office. Um, and I had stated that last time too. Um, it would be nice if there were um, a handicap accessible unit, but I don't see how that can happen since the first floor needs to be office. What I would like to see for the offices is, is some sort of connection between them so the landlord has the option of either renting them separately or renting them to one um, office tenant. So when you come back with a different design for the first floor, I think we would want to see that there is that ability to rent it to either one or two tenants. Um, on the parking, um, I think if, if I've counted correctly, you'll now need only six spaces. Maybe Jenny can help me if I got that right. If that's the case, you're only one space short of the required number of spaces. And um, I'm not sure what the give back would be for that. I think there are a few things that I would expect. These spaces are going to be for the residents. That's the purpose and not for the office tenants. So there would need to be some way to designate them as for the residents only and not for uh, the office tenants. I'd like to see one, at least one electric charging station in the parking lot as part of a offset. And what I'd like to see is something in the, in the, um, the leases for each one of the four units that basically says they only get one parking space. And then with um, the, at least four of the five parking spaces designated with each one of the apartment units on them. Um, I think that's a potential way to um, deal with this that makes sense um, to me. Um, I agree with David. Um, I was very concerned about the trees and I very much appreciate the abutting neighbor on the back who brought it to our attention and then brought the number disparity to the attention of the tree warden. I'd like to thank him for doing that. When I looked at the 11 trees and I did count the number of trees and I appreciated that, I did see that one of the 11 trees is not planted on your property, which doesn't seem right to me. If you can find that screen, Jenny, where it has that, or it shows that, that's it. The, the one in the, in the bottom right is on the other side of the property line. So that would like need to be adjusted. Usually when we approve something, we, we see a planting plan. What are the trees gonna be like? What are the bushes gonna be like? You've shown us hydrangea, rhododendron, things like that. Um, it would be helpful to, I think, have a copy of what the tree plan is that you're gonna to submit to the tree warden for the 11 trees. Um, I, I am concerned as uh, Mr. Lau is concerned about runoff from the driveway and you show some permeable pavers, I think for the front, I wondered if you could do a permeable driveway also that does exist. And I think that would help a lot um, with the runoff. And um, that's pretty much my comments. 
Great. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Katie? Hi, thank you. Um, I don't have a lot of additional comments to add. I wanted to just echo my colleagues that I really appreciate the care you've taken in responding to all of the concerns laid out in the last meeting um, and appreciate, again, bringing four units of housing, um, again, consistent with our master plan. We need more housing and it's great to have that. And I agree with my colleagues that it makes more sense to keep the first floor as office space. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Katie. Before I turn it over to public comment, uh, does anyone else, any other member of the board have any comments or questions? Okay. I, I had one other question. Um, if, if we are going back to office space, my recollection is that the original plan uh, had two restrooms uh, somewhere where the uh, trash room and bike room are, are shown today. And uh, uh, what would the plan be for uh, having restroom access for the, for the office space on the first floor now? Monte, any thoughts? I'm sorry, could you say that again? I, it was kind of jumbled. Oh, that, that's okay. The, the restrooms that were shown on the original plans for the first floor are, are not there anymore because the trash room and, and the bike room are in that space. Uh, so where would you propose to put uh, restrooms for uh, office space on the first floor? I think that if if we go back to a scenario where the whole first floor is an office, I think the best scenario, because I think that someone mentioned it would be great that this could be one tenant or two tenants, the best scenario would be to put the bathroom directly behind the stair so that if we need to create a, a vestibule for access to that, uh, similar to what we did in the previous scenarios, that we could have a tenant on each side and have a vestibule that they each access to get to the bathroom in a lockable situation, um, privatize it. Um, that, that would make the most sense, but you know, if you have other thoughts, we're open to that. Uh, Monty, I thought, can, uh, I think because of the size of the office space, it's under a thousand square feet. I believe uh, one, um, uh, one bathroom should be enough. Uh, but that. if they, if they, if I, I'm hearing comments that, you know, if we want to provide this in a scenario that it can be divided into two offices. Then you would just put a hallway there between the two bathrooms and just have that's that. That's exactly, yeah, that's, a, that's, I, maybe I was being too technical. That's what I was trying to explain. Yep. I agree with you. Could I interject, Mr. Watson? If we, in fact, provide a bathroom uh, in the office space. Would that be one of the prongs that would uh, uh, satisfy the TMA? Well, if, if it included a shower, that would certainly yeah. uh, add to the TDM plan. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll 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 take a look at that and see how we can work that in. Just to be clear to viewers and people on the board, that the plan that I'm showing is the earlier iteration of the plan showing retail completely on the first floor, um, not the current document that's being reviewed, but the older iteration. And they had explained retail was a mistake. It should have said commercial or office, I'm sorry. Right. Okay, any other I, comments? I, I, sorry, I had nothing David. further. No, I'm done. Great, thank you. All right, this time we'd like to open this up for public comment. For any member of the public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function under the participants uh, button on the bottom of your screen. We'll take the, uh, we'll take the uh, public comments in the order that they are identified. Please note that you have three minutes to speak and I'll ask that you identify yourself by your name and address prior to speaking. So first we have um, Andreas Kellis. Thank you, appreciate it. My name is Andreas Kellis. I'm uh, at 15 Woodbury Street. I'm the abutter behind this property. So I have a, uh, you know, a um, um, uh, personal Can we get the address, please? Yeah, Rachel. Yes, please. Thank you. 
please. Thank you. Did that come through that I'm at 15 Woodbury Street? Thank you. Yeah, awesome. So um, I'm, I'm concerned by this. I think as somebody had brought up, um, you know, the tree plan uh, to me is a, it's a very clear situation and I'm not sure um, why we're uh, dancing around this. I'll give you guys the facts. Um, and I've talked to the tree warden, I've looked at the tree plan and I've talked to um, um, some other folks as well. The builder submitted a tree plan of eight trees. This was approved by the tree warden um, and then knowingly removed, you know, three additional trees and violated the tree plan. You know, why was this done? Because the removal of those three additional trees is what enabled this larger development to, to fit in the, in the property and the retaining wall to be built at a larger depth than it, as is required by this plan. Of course, the removal of these trees is irreversible. Um, and now the argument is that we can replant um, these 11 trees, which are not in the mature state that the original trees were, and, uh, and make everything better, and the board should approve this, this reason. Um, as Mr. Watson you know, mentioned, the tree plan was not followed. Um, I think this really troubles me personally, as not just the butter, but as a resident of Arlington. Um, I think it's clear this was a premeditated violation of the tree plan to accommodate a larger project, knowing that once the trees are removed, it's irreversible and the project could be move forward and be approved. To me, you know, I'm involved in business. I think this is a business tactic. This is a disingenuous tactic. And I think it sets a bad projects in Arlington. Um, I urge that the board does not reward this tactic and method of operation by approving their proposed rezoning. You know, I agree it's a beautiful plan. It's a nice um, way that it's being presented, but fundamentally the project and the way that it was done is disingenuous. And I think it's a negative tactic that should not be rewarded. And I don't want to see it happening um, through the town that I live in by other developers. That concludes my, uh, my statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. Let's see, the next person uh, we have is Carl Wagner. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Where, where is this? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. If you Thank can you. It's Carl Wagner, 30 you. Edge Hill Road in Arlington resident. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, very briefly address comments to the board and to the developer. Um, the, the basic thing everyone watching this should know is that this use is not allowed in the B1 district. It is not in fitting, keeping with, with that use. And I appreciate many of the board members really working hard to make a better building, but why didn't you look at the laws of our town? I'd like to speak to the planning director. Aren't you supposed to work for us? And the board appointed by the town manager, aren't you supposed to work for us? The developer is stretching Doing, doing something that shouldn't be done by the, uh, the law that represents mixed use. If it goes through, if you allow this, the people of Arlington, like Mr. Kellis and many others, as these buildings come through, will be, be materially affected by this precedent of changing the intention of the mixed use law and changing the law which does not allow this building to go in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, next up, we have Don Seltzer. Thank you, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I have a couple of comments. First, regarding the usable open space. Um, I'm pleased that the applicant has actually put in the required amount of area. Uh, one point I was going to raise has already been addressed by the board that there needs to be a way to get there. And at the moment, the plans don't show any. Uh, the other concern um, for this is the fact that it's a, uh, my measurement there, it looks like it's something like a 20% slope. And that doesn't even come close to the requirements for usable open space that allows a maximum of an 8% um, an grade. Uh, so there's gonna have to be something done there to make it um, conforming. Um, I'm surprised the board didn't follow up on a question they asked last time, and that is, how are you going to remove the snow from the parking lot? At least in the previous version, there were some grassy areas that you could push it up to, but now you've got 
I think it's around 3,000 square feet, and there's absolutely no place to put it because it's in a canyon surrounded by high walls. And the only thing you can do is push it out onto Mass Ave, uh, which is obviously illegal. Um, I had some comments about problems with the accessible apartment, but those are now moot, so uh, I can ignore those. And uh, I'll return to the, the real major point of all this. Um, in a B1 district, it's quite clear that from the table of uses that you can put in a single family, two family, or three family. You can't put in a four family. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an allowable use in a B1 district. Um, I went through the, all the B1 properties in town and just for interest, there are around a hundred of them and 95% of them are conforming in this way. There are actually four grandfathered non-conforming ones that do have four units, apartment units. Um, when I say grandfathered, I should say great grandfathered um, in that they're all more than a century old. Uh, there's this one in Arlington Center on 16 Swan Street. That happens to be a B1 district and is uh, grandfathered, non-conforming, four bedroom, a rather nice building. The other Mr. three Mr. units- Walter, it's, you're at time, if you could wrap up, please. Okay, uh, just you. that all, all four units that are non-conforming this matter have been built more than a century ago. And there have been no new units, non-conforming units of four apartments built in that time since. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Warden, I do see you, you're, you're next. Okay, am I, am I unmuted? Yes, you are, please. I want to make uh, two, two comments. I'm, so, I'm sorry, could you please state your name and your address? John Worden, 27 Jason Street. Thank you. Uh, an observer of zoning in this town for over 50 years. Um, I just want to make two, 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 two comments. Um, one of the, uh, one of your, um, one of the board members mentioned that the master plan calls for more housing. Let's be precise. The master plan calls for senior housing and affordable housing. Doesn't say anything about increasing the number of market rate apartments. So when we're quoting, let's, it would be great if we followed the, the, the master plan, uh, which does not call for a lot more luxury apartments. That's just adding to our tax burden. The other point I'd like to make is called town meeting. Town meeting is, as you know, the legislative body of this town that makes the laws. And sometimes we are persuaded to make laws. Uh, indeed, in the, in the planning area, we are persuaded to make laws and change them, and sometimes repeal them, by the redevelopment board, which is the planning board in town. In 19, uh, sorry, 2016, when mixed, mixed use was presented to town meeting, your chairman and another member repeatedly said on the floor of town meeting, you can depend on us. We don't, you don't have to put limitations on us. Nothing, no use that's not permitted in a particular zone will be included in mixed use. And I, when I spoke, I said, well, traditionally we have been a rule of laws, not of men. And I'm sure you're all honorable men, but suppose you are succeeded by those who are less honorable. And, and, they, and, and, they, they are, and they take a different viewpoint that you have expressed, that you have used to convince the town meeting to approve this, this, uh, this mixed, use pro, pro, uh, uh, mixed use provision. Um, well, we didn't even have to wait for new members. Your former chairman himself said, well, mixed use means we can do anything we want. It doesn't matter. I get, he didn't say, it doesn't matter what I promised town meeting but he may as well have. And I warned against that. And the town meeting thought, no, we'll trust, we'll trust the redevelopment board to do what they said they would do. And now we are seeing 
that that trust apparently was misplaced. You should turn this whole thing down. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Loretti, Chris Loretti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to follow up with a, a couple comments. And I, I think it's worthwhile that the board take a look at the definition or description of the neighborhood office district in the zoning bylaw. Because what the bylaw says is the district is one where the predominant uses include one and two family dwellings, houses with offices on the ground floor, or office structures which are in keeping with the scale of adjacent houses primarily located on or adjacent to Massachusetts Avenue. This district is intended to encourage preservation of small scale structures to provide contrast, uh, to provide contrast and set off the higher density, more active areas along the avenue. So what happens is we have a two family house that's torn down and now we have a four or five unit apartment building with a token amount of office space proposed in its place. And clearly that's not in keeping with the definition of the district. And it's not in keeping with the requirement under a special permit that the, the district um, or that the development not impair the character inte or integrity of the district. Clearly that's happening now. And that's not a, just a matter of policy or preference. As Mr. Wagner pointed out, it's a matter of law. And as you know, your board is currently being sued in another context for allowing in a mixed use development, a use that is not allowed in a particular zoning district. You're repeating your past mistakes. And I really don't see how you can allow this to proceed until the courts decided on that question. Uh, I mean, seriously, are you encouraging the uh, abutter of this property to appeal this permit because the fact is that if you grant this permit for this non-permitted use that is what you're doing you're jeopardizing the town you're jeopardizing the board and you are acting in contrary to the representations made to town meeting when the mixed use zoning bylaw was passed thank you thank you mr loretti is there any is there any other member of the public that would like to make a comment on this particular docket number. Seeing none, I'll turn it back to members of the board. Um, let's see, so we have a number of comments that have uh, come forth, uh, some having to do with uh, civil information, some having to do with uh, revisions to the design of the building, some clarifications on the uh, accessible, uh, excuse me, usable open space, and some additional clarifications on the uh, transportation demand management plan. Um, wanted to get some feedback from the other members of the board if we'd like to, to see that, to see those clarifications at a, at a future meeting. I'm seeing Jean saying yes. yes. I think the civil plans, I, I would like to see the civil plans before we move forward with, with approval. And the new, what, how they're going to restructure the first floor office right. space and some of the other things that I think almost everyone on the board mentioned is needed. Right. So I do have a um, list of those. Sorry, go ahead, please, Ken. Sorry. Um, thank you, uh, Rachel. I'm on the fence. I, I, I'm okay with, uh, I think, uh, approving this with provisions and uh, um, letting Jenny follow through with um, what we what we envisioned. I think um, some of the actual changes we talked about are just changing the window types and adding some vertical trim to break up the, uh, the scale of the side elevations. Um, the other one was to add some uh, show uh, proper drainage. And I think that's gonna have to go through uh, DPW anyways. And um, adding the stairs have access up there, That's that is going to be what's you know stairs up there. Um, the only thing that might be in question is the location of the bathroom. But typically in commercial space, um, that's just a dashed line depending on what the, uh, the tenant's going to want, anyways. 
if it's if like Jean said, it's going to be one tenant or is it going to be two tenants? Uh, I think we want to give them some sort of a flexibility of uh, of locating that since it's a new building. That's the advantage of having a new building. You can sort of custom it, and it may encourage someone to rent the space because it's a new building. It's not there's not things to fix in there. Um, I also, they also, I believe they're addressing the issues with uh, the tree worn. And um, I think I agree with um, Robert saying that, you know, they'll abide by whatever the tree worn comes up with. And if 11 is 11, you know, I would, you know, say, you know, let's try to say with the tree worn, to encourage as much uh, mature trees as possible. But that's my feeling. I think I'm on the fence right now. I can sort of see not holding up this progress right here because it's just, we're just asking them to see stuff. We're not asking them to make changes. And that's where I stand. David, do you have an opinion my, one way or the other? Um. I hear what Ken is is saying. Um, I I do feel like uh, like we do need to see more on the TDM plan um, in order to feel comfortable granting parking relief uh, because what's what's shown so far is just not sufficient. If I could make a suggestion. Please. We could either do a shower or we could charge for parking. We're open to either. That's that third prong. I think if, if we provide that, then we've satisfied the TMA. I think hey, Gene, David's, I think David's TMA, not my TMA. I want G the leases. TDM. TDM, I'm sorry. I want the leases to limit to one parking space per apartment. And I'd like to have a um, electric charging station for cars in the backyard. So I have a slightly different list than David does. Uh, I, I don't I, disagree I, with your I, list, Gene. I, I think we have to decide on a, on what what the mix should be. Yeah. Gene, are you talking about a conduit for the availability for a charging station or a charging station? We're gonna do a charging station for sure. Charging station. Okay. We can do a charging station, no problem. We right. can do a shower and the the issue with the lease, I think we can we can address that no problem. Um, my the other issue that I remain concerned about is how how the tree situation gets resolved. I I if I understand the proposal is to plant eleven trees because eleven trees were removed, but that doesn't restore the property to the state it was in prior to the improper tree removal. Uh, on the other hand, it's really not it, it's not within our power to uh directly address the tree issue that's the tree warden's responsibility and uh i don't know other than requiring them to replace the trees i don't know whether there is anything else in the tree warden's power to uh to do uh that uh or could ask them to do to make up for for the removal of those mature trees so uh i'm i'm not I'm not very happy that this is where we're at, um, but I'm also not sure that there is uh, any any benefit um, to uh, to uh, waiting for the tree warden to do something else. We're going to satisfy whatever the bylaw says and the tree warden says. That's why I suggested earlier if we could move on this matter this evening uh, and have as a condition subsequent that the uh, approval would be su uh, subject to that condition subsequent that the tree warden approve the tree plan for the replacement of the 11 trees 
that's what I would be requesting. Taking a note, uh, I would agree, David. I, 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 I think that that's really the, the best that we could under our jurisdiction request as part of this uh, a condition in this approval. Um, I think the, the question I would have that I'm still struggling with is the actual usability of that usable open space, um, which again, absent of any additional information, um, how, how people are going to access that and, and ensuring that it is truly usable. I know that you know when we recently approved a project with usable open space, that was one of the things that was, was a condition that there were amenities provided such that the residents could actually use and enjoy that space. Um, so I wanted to see if you could address, again, how you envisioned um, residents actually using that, that space. Marte? Yes, um, we can certainly do an updated plan to show the, tr the, the stair axis on the side that we were missing. Um, we did look at the grading. I think that pretty much there's a good portion of that that meets the 8% requirement. Um, so I think that we do need to provide some update to show how that works. Jenny? Um, Rachel, I just might suggest we have another hearing that was supposed to start a while ago. Um, I might suggest some sort of movement um, at this point in time, sure. a decision to either continue or, or something else. It sounds like there are a lot of matters that need to be resolved. Um, so I, I can provide you other dates for continuation if needed. So I personally, I think, would like to see resolution on the, the civil um, the civil issues and the usable open space um, prior to having a, a vote. But again, if, if the others feel ready to, to vote, I'm, I'm also on the fence. Ken, you said that you're, you're ready. I'm ready to vote. Jean? I would prefer a continuance for the reasons you said. I also would like to see how they're going to redesign the front facade now that there's not the apartment there as well as what the open space is going to look like or the commercial Katie? space. Yep. I'm ready to vote. And David, I, I heard that you, you'd be interested in seeing this come before us once again. Yes. Okay. So I think we'll, we'll plan to continue this. Um, Jenny, if, if you um, could provide us with, with some dates I think November 2nd would be my suggestion. It's after your three hearings that are for zoning warrant articles coming up. Um, that evening, you might also be discussing your report to town meeting, but I think that would be the next possible option to continue. And I think that's, I would, I would guess that's enough time for the applicant to be responsive, um, but I, I also won't assume that, so I can provide another date no, that, uh, that the next the, the yeah, next date would be December, as you know, December seventh. Second would be fine, Jenny. Yeah. Okay. Okay. November second. So before I ask for a motion to continue to November second, um, I'll run through the list of of items that I have here to be addressed. So that would be access to the rear usable open space, um, changing the casement windows on the side facades to double hung, and the rear. And the rear. Thank you, Ken. Um, adding vertical separation to the uh, to the side facades to to break up uh, the massing. Um, looking at the possibility of a roof deck or solar panels on the roof, including civil engineering drawings, including the trench drains at the end of the driveways, or looking at permeable surface for the uh, driveway. 
a detail on the guardrail or fencing at the usable open space, changing the accessible unit to office space, preparing a uh, transportation demand management plan, including a shower room for the office spaces, charging station for um, electric vehicles, and um, putting a provision in the lease uh, for the spaces beyond the one parking space included per unit, addressing the actual usability of the usable open space, addressing the tree species and sizes uh, subject to approval with the tree warden. And that's what I had on my list. Did anyone have anything else that I'm missing? Could I ask Jean one question? Please. Uh, Jean, with respect to the Transportation Management Act, what do I need to satisfy you? I, I, I just asked for those things the electric charging station that each of the leases limits the tenant to one parking space and that the parking in back is reserved for the tenants and not for the uh, office. Okay. Thank you. And David had some others. I have yeah, David. Those are in the list that I just read off as well. I have David, too. Yeah. Yes, Jenny? Hey, uh, in relationship to the parking is um, the signage uh, that reflects uh, Jean's uh, right. preference. Right. Thank Great. you, Jenny. I forgot. Great. Okay, so do I hear a motion to continue the hearing with the uh, stated provisions to uh, November 2nd? So moved. We have a second. Second. I will take a roll call for a vote. Uh, Ken? No. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? No. And I am a yes. So this uh, will be continued to November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, um, Aaron, your co-host, right? Yes, I am. Okay, so you'll, Aaron's gonna share the screen um, because the applicant who is on has some other images that would like to be uh, shared and also you have the image of the application if needed, right? Yep. Okay, sorry, Rachel, just needed to clarify. No problem, I appreciate it. Okay, so we'll be now be opening docket number 3637 for 476 Mass Avenue. Uh, this is an application filed on September 25th by Chad Cohen, Marco Realty Group, in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, Section 11 in the Town of Arlington Zoning Bylaws. They are proposing to renovate the facade of the vacant storefront at 476 Massachusetts Avenue in the B5 Central Business District. Uh, so who do we have here uh, this evening representing the applicant? Hello, it's, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yeah, Chad Go, I'm applicant. Great, thank you. Please uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, before you go ahead, um, Jenny or Aaron, do you have anything um, from the uh, planning department to share? I, um, just to share that um, it, it's a little, different than normal but the Histor Arlington Historical Commission has already reviewed this plan <laughs> and provided their uh, decision um, of approval and so what we're being shown this evening has already been has already been covered by the his you know, to meet the Historical Commission's guidelines uh, for appropriateness in this district um, it's not an historic district but they do have um, the ability to review signs and any other facade changes um, which they have done. Um, and the only thing I would add is that some of the members of the board re may recall that we spent a lot of time reviewing the next door unit um, and space. Um, and I would just state that I was, I'm very pleased to see what this uh, property owner is planning to do with this particular, uh, this unit in the building, which I think has been very challenging to rent, frankly, as a result of the conditions that they're trying to improve. 
So um, I'll turn it over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Chad, I apologize for cutting you off before. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah, no problem. So it's uh, 476 Mass Ave. It's, they had an old brick storefront that was put in probably like the 60s or 70s. Uh, and we're going to take it down and put in a new glass storefront to make the uh, space more rentable. That's about it. That's about it. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I will turn it over to my colleagues for any questions. Uh, Katie? The plan seemed really straightforward and with the approval of the Historic Commission. Um, yeah, I don't have any further questions. Great. Thank you. Um, Ken? Yeah, um, we're just reviewing the signage, correct? I mean, this is not a special permit use because it's not a change of use. It's still what it, it, it's still a retail space. The only thing we're reviewing is signage. Is that correct? No, you're reviewing Why this not? because they're cha they're significantly changing the architectural design and facade of a building that is along Mass Ave. You also are in charge of looking at the signage. Um, there isn't a tenant though, so you're, you're only looking at the sign band. When they have a tenant identified, we would be charged with reviewing their signage. Um, but at this point in time, there is no use identified other than the existing use, which I believe is just retail or office or uh, commercial space. Um, but it is, those are the reasons why you're reviewing this. Well, uh, I'm gonna agree with uh, Katie and say, um, I have no real comments. Um, the historic commission looked at it and I agree with them. It's, it's a nice change. Great. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Jean. I agree with my colleagues. I think it's a really nice improvement. I have no comments, questions or comments. Other. Okay. David. I also agree. Uh, I never understood why there was that strange curved brick facade there. Uh, so I, I think this is a good improvement. And if the historic commission's okay with it, then I have no other issues. Great. Um, I, I also agree. I think this is a significant improvement. And um, knowing that we're not approving any any signage specifically. The only question that I had was actually on the side of, um, I think that's uh, the elevation two. Um, you have some goosenecks above a, looks like a, a recess um, in, the, uh, in the facade there. So I just wanted to ensure that there was no signage planned there. Are those, those aren't windows. I, I assume those are, there's some sort of a decorative element or a recess there. Yeah, that's correct. I think the brick, the brick is decorative. Um, and when we had this drawn up, we had both doors vacant. Uh, but right now, but yeah, 478 got rented. So we're just focused on 476. Okay, but there's no signage planned in that, in that area um, where the goosenecks are along the, the side, correct? Because yeah. you would only be allowed one sign on that. That's, I, yes, I believe you're referencing the um, yeah, number two Swan Place right side elevation. Yeah, there's no signage planned uh, okay. there as far as my knowledge goes. Great, that was my only question. Uh, any other questions from the board before we turn this over to public comment? Okay, seeing none, if any member of the public would like to, um, to speak in reference to this docket number, please raise your hand using the raise hand function under the participant but button and I'll call you in the order received. Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. Um, let's see, do I uh, have a motion for approval of this, um, of this docket as, I, we didn't have any real comments, so as submitted. <laughs> so motioned. Do I have a second? Second. Great, I'll take a, a roll call for approval, uh, starting with Ken. Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am yes as well. Congratulations on the approval of your plans. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. 
Let's see, moving to the next item on our agenda is the uh, presentation of the economic analysis of the industrial zoning districts. And I believe, um, Jenny, you had mentioned that Aaron was going to be taking us through that. Yes, um, Aaron is going to be making a brief introduction. And then we also have Eric Halverson um, from RKG. Sorry about that. And um, Emily Innes, who is with Harriman. Um, and the three of them are going to be making, I think there's a PowerPoint presentation. Um, Aaron's going to be scrolling through that after the presentation ends, then we'll, um, I think, open it up for discussion. And I believe that also we have, uh, just to note, um, Ralph Wilmer, as well as uh, John Warden, um, and of course, David, all participate in the Zoning Bylaw Working Group. Um, so there might be additions to anything else said. Um, after the presentation as well. I want to thank Emily and Eric for their work on the project and I'm looking forward to their presentation and our discussion. It's a lot of interesting interesting details to share tonight. So thank you and Erin are you all set? Maybe? Yes I am. Um, okay. I just want to make sure um, I see Eric and oh there's Eric. Okay thank you. Pulling up the presentation. Um, so uh, let me just make this full screen. Can everyone still see that? Okay, great. Um, so uh, thanks Jenny for the introduction. Um, welcome Eric and Emily uh, to the meeting. Um, we will have a presentation tonight on um, a project that we kicked off uh, about this time last year on the economic analysis of industrial zoning districts. Um, at this point, we are here to present draft zoning recommendations for consideration. Um, on the agenda, I'll go through the goals and the background. Um, Eric will take us through the process to date. Um, Emily will take us through translating concepts to draft zoning and present the draft zoning as well. Um, so the project goals of this project, um, as stated in the request for proposals that we submitted, was to position Arlington to attract new businesses and jobs and emerging growth industries to the industrial district as well as create opportunities through which Arlington can realize greater revenue with strategic amendments to the zoning bylaw and the zoning map. And as you can see in the graphic, those um, purple areas are um, our industrial districts. Um, so a quick uh, note about the project background. Um, last year in September, we released an RFP um, RKG, and, uh, RKG Associates and Harriman were selected as our contractor. Um, in December of last year, we held a project kickoff. Um, and during uh, 2020, um, RKG and Harriman completed an economic analysis, um, the preparation of zoning recommendations. At the beginning of the summer, we held a virtual public engagement opportunity, which was a video presentation and a survey um, that uh, community members could take at their own pace um, due to the pandemic. Um, and more recently, uh, with the end of the summer arriving, um, we began working on the draft zoning amendments. Um, the uh, zoning bylaw working group were, was presented with um, the draft zoning amendments on October 7th. Um, they uh, are still in the midst of reviewing it and providing comments. Um, so now is the perfect time to present this to um, the redevelopment board. Um, you can also see the members of the zoning bylaw working group on the slide and I'll note that um, this is not slated for uh, a town meeting yet. Um, definitely not the special town meeting, um, which would be a really accelerated timeline. Um, but we're looking for feedback right now on um, the draft zoning, um, but there's there's room for um, uh, time to uh, improve this. So with that, I'll turn it over to Eric and Emily and just let me know when to switch the slide. Great, um, thanks so much, Eric. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, um, thanks for the intro, Erin. Um, 
and uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Halverson, I'm Vice President and Principal with RKG Associates and uh, joining me is uh, Emily Innes from Harriman. Um, we have been the uh, two leads from each of our firms working uh, with Jenny and Aaron in the Zoning Bylaw Working Group over the last um, 10 or 12 months on this project. So, so happy to be invited tonight to share our progress so far and some of the zoning work that uh, we'd love your feedback on. So just uh, very quickly on the on the timeline, um, this process has been uh, slightly drawn out, probably like everything nowadays due to the COVID situation. Uh, we originally intended this to go a little bit quicker, but um, obviously we're uh, all dealing with this um, with all of our projects. So we began in November of 2019. Um, the plan is to continue work through, I think, the remainder of 2020. Um, during this time, as Aaron mentioned, our team undertook a townwide market analysis of each of the districts um, that really looked at supply and demand for commercial and residential development. Um, together with Harriman, we looked at different land use scenarios in each of the industrial districts to sort of test what size buildings might fit as a way to help inform the zoning. Uh, we also um, conducted a the sort of potential fiscal impacts of future development. We looked at that. And then um, we sort of the zoning concepts uh, that we looked at, which eventually led to the zoning recommendations that um, Emily is going to be talking to you about tonight. Next. So I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes kind of giving an overview of some of the land use, real estate, and market data for the industrial districts as kind of a precursor to um, Emily's discussion on the zoning. Next. Um, so as Aaron mentioned, this map uh, shows the location of the five industrial zoning districts, which are primarily located along Mass Ave, um, sort of in between Mass Ave and the Minuteman Bikeway for the most part. And working from west to east, we refer to them commonly as Park Avenue, Forest Street, Dudley Street, Mill Street, and Mystic Street. So there's five in total that we looked at. And as you can see, the industrial areas are really surrounded by a wide range of other zoning districts, including uh, both business zoning districts as well as residential. Um, and that really, you know, I think kind of makes these industrial districts unique in their land use composition, uh, as well as the sort of character of the development that you'll see uh, in each of these districts. Next. Um, from a use perspective, the industrial districts comprise a very small number of parcels at only about 0.7% of Arlington's total number of parcels and only about 1.2% of all the land acreage in Arlington. So they are very small districts that comprise a very small amount of Arlington's total land area. And also from a development perspective, the built space within the industrial districts really only comprises about 1.2% of the 48 million square feet of built space in the town. So in terms of the buildings and the space they take up, it's also a, a fairly small amount. Next. Um, about 69 of the properties or the parcels within the industrial districts are currently used for businesses classified by the town's uh, assessor's office as industrial. Um, these businesses are mostly auto repair, storage, and warehousing in nature, um, but there are actually some unique R&D and lab spaces that we found tucked away in the districts as we did um, our field work and our site visits. And what's interesting is that the land these buildings are sitting on top of is assessed at about twice as much as the buildings themselves. Um, this suggests to us that if someone were to purchase an industrial property today and redevelop that land, they would likely need to seek development alternatives that could attain higher rents or higher lease rates um, because they end up paying so much um, sort of per acre for not only the building, but really for the land itself. Um, and this sort of creates uh, redevelopment pressures or even pressures to sort of change the use from maybe sort of lower scale or lower end industrial to something that could attain those higher rents or lease rates. Next. Um, during the early stages of the process, we conducted several focus group interviews and heard that existing businesses that are here today in Arlington really value this land um, as it's quite scarce, uh, you know, comprising only point, I think 1.2% of the land area. And if they were to sell, um, one of the challenges that they have is that they would really have to, um, they would likely have to locate or relocate much further out in the region to find industrial space that's both available as well as cheap enough to be able to run their businesses. Um, we also heard that there are some challenges with the existing districts, such as um, parking for uh, larger vehicles because the parcels are smaller and the buildings tend to take up, um, take up a lot of space on the sites. And um, we also heard a lot about the difficulties of having some 
some types of industrial uses located next to residential. Um, and that is not only the case for residential um, districts or even residential buildings that are adjacent to the industrial districts, but also within some of the industrial districts, you have housing that's sitting next to commercial and industrial uses. Next. Um, this idea of not a ton of industrial commercial space in town was also backed up through some of the market data that we obtained um, through CoStar, which showed that there were no commercial sales listings in Arlington over the three-year period from 2017 to 2019. Um, in the three years prior, you can see those little blue dots sort of indicate um, sales by quarter. Uh, throughout each of those years. There were only about 13 total listings um, between 2014 and 2016. And um, as of late 2019, when we collected the data, the commercial vacancy rate in Arlington was frequently shown as being below 2%. Next. So placing added pressure on top of that low commercial vacancy rate and the desirability of the industrial districts are the rapidly rising housing prices for both owner-occupied housing and rental housing. Uh, much like the rest of the immediate Boston region, Arlington's median home value has increased over $300,000 since 2008. Um, people want to live in Arlington, and the supply and demand equilibrium in the region is really causing a, a significant drive uh, up in the cost of housing, uh, but also the cost of land and the cost of construction. Sort of all three of those things are, are really coupled together. Uh, next. And the same is true on the rental side. Median monthly rent in 2019 in Arlington uh, was just under $2,500 a month. Um, while rents here are lower than almost all of the adjacent communities that we looked at, which are shown here um, in this graph, it's still quite high compared to median household incomes in the area. Uh, the, these increasing housing prices and the changing income dynamics in all these communities, not just Arlington, are driving factors for investors who are seeking cheaper land in some of these commercial and industrial districts. Next. So that really led us to a question of um, if we can, um, you know, what, what kind of potential demand might there be over the next 10 years for commercial and industrial space in Arlington? So the way that we went about answering that was we took employment projections over the next 10 years for Middlesex County and we applied what we call a fair share approach to see how much space might be needed in Arlington um, if the town continued to grab its fair share, about 1% uh, as it's been over the last few years of all the employment growth and job growth in Middlesex County. So if we take that 1% figure and apply it to future employment growth, it equates to about 200,000 square feet of additional space needs over the next 10 years or about 20,000 square feet annually. So not, not a ton, 20,000 square feet um, you know, is, is not a lot by any measure, uh, but it is some. Uh, some of this could be absorbed by existing vacancies or even additions to existing buildings. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be brand new built space, although it could be. Um, much of that future growth is projected to be in industry sectors like research and development, the sciences, higher education, computers and tech, um, C-suite management of companies, those kinds of uh, industry sectors, which, um, if we compare those to what's in the industrial districts today, those two things are, are very different. Next. But interestingly, um, there are companies, and I like to point out Tetra Genetics because it's one of the few examples of kind of the biotech R&D industry in Arlington's industrial districts today. So Tetra Genetics was really breaking that mold and moved to Arlington in 2015 from Cambridge. Um, the company was looking for more affordable space, a space that met their needs, and also a space that was closer to where some of their employees lived in Arlington. And Arlington at the same time has, has definitely done a lot to position itself for the entry of biotech um, by becoming uh, a certified mass bioready community and also allowing these types of uses uh, in the zoning today. Next. So some of the key takeaways for us that helped inform the zoning recommendations um, in our discussions with the zoning bylaw working group, um, the existing industrial districts, as I mentioned, are, are very diverse in their businesses, the types of businesses that are there today, as well as their employment. And most of the jobs actually pay relatively well compared um, to other jobs in the town. At the same time, um, 
firms in these what we like to call legacy industrial sectors in Arlington still struggle to justify the higher rents. And if they have to move out, as I mentioned before, they'll really need to locate much further out in the region. Um, one of the unique dynamics about the industrial districts today is a fair number of the properties and the buildings are actually owner occupied. So the people who own and operate the businesses um, might actually in many cases own the building and the land. Um, so it kind of puts them in a unique position where they're not necessarily impacted by increasing rents or increasing lease rates. Um, they own the building and whether they have a mortgage or they don't, um, you know, they're paying that off as they go along. Um, but at the same time, um, it's, it's important to note that there is potential to attract the sort of high tech or biotech uses as the industrial districts maybe tend to morph over time. Um, you know, we think they do, they do and would view Arlington as desirable. It's certainly a little bit less expensive than being in Cambridge or Boston, but at the same time, recruitment um, could be challenging if you're trying to compete with Cambridge, Boston, uh, Waltham, Watertown, Somerville, uh, where a lot of that lab development, the R&D is taking place. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that the pressure from the housing market will continue, um, of course, until there's a better balance that can be achieved across the entire region from a housing perspective. Uh, and I think that's just an important consideration uh, as we discuss the zoning. So that's my quick overview and I'll turn it to Emily for the zoning piece. Thank you very much, Eric and Aaron, if you don't mind moving to the next slide, please. So when we uh, worked with Eric and the working group over the summer, um, early spring into the summer, one of the things that we did was show a lot of fit studies. So we took the information that Eric gave us, looked at different parcels in the five different areas and said, what can fit on these sites given the other physical constraints, um, uh, whether it's the uh, irregular parcel shapes, whether it's the presence of the brooks and the wetland buffers. Obviously, the Minuteman Bikeway was a key asset for potential employers in these areas or current employers in these areas. Um, so the idea was to, to take the, these FIT studies and start to develop zoning guidelines uh, and uh, um, dimensional standards for them. And as part of that, we also proposed uh, several uses, and we started to think about if we varied any of the existing zoning to allow, for example, bonuses for development, what are the types of things that we would want to have in there, we being obviously the community of Arlington and then ourselves as, as professionals trying to figure out this puzzle, um, what's important, what are the trade-offs if you allow a relaxation of some dimensional standards or require tightening of others? And then, then as we took those concepts that we tested in May and tested again in June in the survey, uh, the next question was, how do you create standards that are enforceable at the right point? So in other words, if what you're doing is reviewing an application for uh, a use or for a building permit, what um, standards can be put into place at that point to review and what are the things that would have been nice to have but are really tenant driven and would happen after um, after a building is permitted or use is permitted so uh, we considered this developer against tenant relationship uh, the enforceability whether or not the incentives we were looking to have were temporary or permanent incentives and then also thinking about the relationship some of the nice to have haves uh, or even required cost more than others. So, you know, those things should deserve a greater relaxation of the rules or a greater um, density bonus or however we were thinking about it at the time. And then also finally, and this came out of some of the, the discussion in the, the public uh, meeting was that idea of what's the public benefit versus the private benefit. So um, as you're thinking about, okay, and one of the things that we targeted was height, of course. Um, if you're thinking of, for example, increased height, uh, what's, the, what's the benefit to the public of allowing that increased height? So this is how we started to think about these. So Aaron, next slide, please. So the first off, we looked at uses, and uh, this goes to the idea of um, uh, zoning almost as marketing in a way, is that some of these uses are probably allowable underneath your current regulations if you push them a little bit um, and think about the flexibility of definitions. But there's a lot to be said for calling out particular uses because you want them in your community. So um, things like the breweries, distilleries, the wineries, 
Food production facilities almost certainly could fit under your um, light industrial with a few tweaks. But again, these are things that you want to have, and they may also require different standards. And so when you look at the zoning guidelines, or the, the draft zoning rather, you'll note that we've got some new uses in there, and we've got with those new uses some development standards. Now, it was brought up in the working group that those development standards don't belong in the definitions, and I completely agree with that. But we've kept them together for the purposes of review so that you can see this use requires something a little bit different. Um, and then once uh, we're, we're all firm on the uses, um, we'll move them into the appropriate point in the draft zoning. Next slide, please. So these are, again, some of the additional um, uses that you could have work only, artist studio, makerspace, vertical farming. These again might fit under your light industrial, but it makes a lot more sense to call them out as these are the types of things that we'd like to see in Arlington. Next slide, please. So then we started to think about, okay, what are the base development standards that are appropriate? You are uh, going to build or significantly rehabilitate a building that already exists. Uh, what are, what's the town going to require from you? So one idea was to have the building solar ready and the working group brought up, we probably need a definition of that. So I've pulled one out. Um, we want the buildings to stay relatively close to the sidewalk. So it's not going to be as close of a street wall uh, in that you have all the buildings lined up together as it might be in a downtown area. And certainly um, people in the, the public meetings brought up the idea of maybe you don't want them too close to the sidewalk in an industrial, whether it's because we want wider sidewalks or a plaza or just a little bit more green space and perhaps trees to off offset the heat island effect. Let's keep them, but we want them to keep them close enough. So we're leaving it 10 feet from the lot line, but you know, no more than that. Um, and then the use of yards for low impact stormwater management, especially in the areas where we're in a wetland buffer. Um, and that you'll see that again, the idea of stormwater management when we get to parking. Um, key pieces, we want transparency. We want those ground floor windows to have the feeling of being activated. Even if you're not necessarily looking all the way through, there are standards on, on how that's dealt with. We'd like the facades to have equal treatment, yet just because it's an industrial building doesn't mean it has to be, you know, blank facades and all four sides. And it's critical to have connections um, from the public sidewalk to the front entry. And then lighting, dark sky friendly, no overspill, no up lighting. Um, things that contribute, uh, frankly, to uh, energy efficiency as well as dark sky friendliness. Next slide, please. Then we get into this idea of pedestrian amenities. So Eric mentioned earlier that, and, and as did Aaron, these um, industrial areas are close to, if not directly abutting residential neighborhoods. So to get from one area to the other, we really wanted to help create a walkable environment. So the standards you saw earlier, which are not typical for industrial, the idea of the equal treatment of facades, the transparency, and then having the buildings a lot closer to the street, that starts to create the walkable environment. But then we wanted pedestrian amenities, and especially because of the bikeway, um, and the ability for people to actually commute from the residential neighborhoods by bike or by walking to places of employment, let's make that a little bit more attractive. So here's where we get into choices. And this is the idea of how do we make it easier for developers to come in and meet the requirements we want them to meet. Um, and they get to have a choice. So on the top choice, they can choose either shade trees or planters, which has the effect of greening up the uh, area, uh, making it a little bit more attractive, but also, especially in the case of the shade trees, dealing with uh, uh, heat impact uh, um, or heat island impact over time. Then they get a second choice. So first they've cho chosen the green parts. Now we want some uh, additional amenities, whether it's public art on the left, two benches in the middle, or um, uh, that's an example of artful rainwater design where public art and the stormwater are actually integrated into one. So the idea is you've got a, an active uh, view of the stormwater. The key here is that you're creating either visual interests or you're creating a place where pedestrians can rest. And you see that um, the two benches comes about because Eric and I had a discussion where he said, are you really going to let them um, just have put one bench in and call it a day? So we're trying to create these things that are reasonable trade-offs with each other. Next slide, please, Eric. 
So then we get to the idea of the height bonus. Now in this area, there is already, there's a couple of things um, happening. Uh, there is a step back um, uh, after you go up a certain number of stories. We're removing that. It doesn't make sense for an industrial building because that becomes wasted space at the upper floors. And there's also, um, as I'm sure you're aware, the reduced height um, uh, when you're abutting the residential area. So we're addressing that in two different ways. One is we're allowing the developer to potentially have a bonus in height where he doesn't have, uh, where they can go up to um, 50, uh, two feet um, from 39 and if um, if they meet certain requirements and so the first thing is the roof we tried to think about what was it that a developer uh, somebody actually building the building as opposed to a tenant so it could be an owner occupier as well what they would be able to install at the time of construction and so we touched on the roof um, partly for the environmental aspects of it and uh, getting closer to net zero um, and this is an overall public benefit um, and partly to reduce stormwater management um, needs uh, or again uh, looking at the heat island impact. So these are the options um, and there's percentages in the zoning itself. These are just the images itself. So they can do any one of those roof treatments or accommodation thereof and they have to do 100% on-site stormwater management, which will help with water quality as well. Next slide, please. Then for parking standards, I mentioned already that we have the idea of the low impact development and integrating the stormwater management into the surface. Um, we're also requiring for impervious surfaces, high albedo surfaces um, and shade, again, dealing with heat island impact in an area and in type of use that tends to have a lot of impervious surfaces. Um, if they're going to want to provide more parking than is required by the regulations, that has to be pervious surfaces. Highly encouraging rain gardens, electric vehicle charging stations, and we also altered the required number of spaces. We decreased the requirement for cars and we increased the requirement for bicycles. Again, with the Minuteman bikeway path there, having access um, from, the from the neighborhoods to jobs and be able to commute by bike is ideal. We want to encourage that. Next slide, please. So these are the specific modifications we're looking at. The definitions, removing requirements for the upper story setbacks, including new development standards and standards for additional height, We've redefined the industrial district um, to allow the mix of uses, including residential as an accessory use and retail as an accessory use. Um, uh, change the dimensional and de density regulations um, and uh, change some of the review and approval thresholds for different uses, making more of the things that we want by right. Um, and then finally, the changes to the parking. So that's a brief overview of it and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the uh, thoroughness and the, the um, unique ideas too that, that come towards the end of the presentation too with, with really giving people um, choice too in, in some of the ways that you're addressing uh, some of the, the options as well. Um, I'll throw it out to the board members for any questions or, or comments starting with uh, Jean. Yeah, I, I think um, it's a terrific work and I think it's going to be really, really helpful uh, for the town and I look forward to seeing when you actually have the draft uh, bylaw changes for us to look at. I only had a few very minor comments. One was on the definition of solar ready because I think what people are starting to find now, it doesn't have to be solar voltaics, it can be solar hot water or solar thermal. And the way you've defined solar ready seems to only allow for solar voltaics and not the others. So I just put that out there as something to think about. Um, second on the roofs too, I just wonder if there's some sort of conflict between allowing vegetated roofs and blue roofs and solar ready and all of those things at the same time to allow um, the additional height. I don't know if there is or not, but I, I just wondered about that. Um, the, and then on vertical farming, I wonder if you took a look at um, the town's rules on marijuana cultivation to make sure 
that um, what, I'm not saying there'd be vertical farming of marijuana, I have no idea how that works, but if it did, that there tends to be no conflict between what we would allow with vertical farming and the town's current rules on marijuana cultivation or whether we need to change the bylaws in marijuana to deal with the possibility of vertical farming. So uh, that was it. I really was impressed. I thought um, the proposals all looked like they would be very helpful. Great. Thank you, Jean. Uh, David? Well, I uh, am on the uh, zoning bylaw working group and uh, so have uh, been been looking at this uh, for a while and uh, just wanted to say thank you to RKG and Harriman for the great work on this and, and bringing some really interesting ideas to the discussion. Um, other than um, than things that have already been mentioned, my, my major comment had to do with bike parking and the potential for uh, drawing large numbers of bicyclists to something like a tasting room adjacent to the Minuteman. Um, and the fact that I had seen uh, problems with sufficient bike parking uh, at a brewery with a tasting room in Somerville, which is, uh, while not too hard to get to, is not quite as accessible as a tasting room would, on the Minuteman would be. So I could imagine that being very popular and wasn't sure whether we should um, specifically uh, think about how to encourage um, much more bike parking uh, in that kind of scenario, uh, or, or just leave it to to the business people to to figure out if and when they they had that issue. But I know that Aeronaut Brewing in um, in Somerville had a very significant bike parking problem, which I'm not sure they've actually fully resolved to this day. Uh, despite being very popular. But that was that was all I had. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, Katie? Um, that just as with my fellow board members, I'm really impressed by this presentation. Um, I wanted to echo David's comments about bike parking. I'm really excited about how much has already been built into this proposal and to be attentive to sort of places where maybe we can even add in more given that that's like one of the incredible assets of this town. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to flag is something I really appreciated was the emphasis on um, improving the pedestrian experience in these places. Um, you know, it feels like the being able to speak to the community benefits is clearly going to be really important as we present any bylaw changes and thinking about sort of what we do in those places and making it a more pleasant place to walk seems like a really important contribution. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Katie and Kim. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for all your good work here. I do have a couple of quick questions here. Um, when I first read this, I thought that this was putting a little too much um, stress on requirements for owners and developers that, um, for, in these industrial areas. I mean, we're trying to encourage growth and encourage uh, development and maintain these industrial areas. And, you know, it seems like every give back that we were giving them, the requirements seem like, you know, twice as much, which is opposite of discouraging uh, growth in, uh, and uh, development. Um, I, I, then when I thought back, then I went, you know, I, I read this several times. So, um, you know, so I'm, as I'm reading through it again and again, I'm feeling less so, but I'm still, that, that initial thought still hasn't left me. I mean, we're trying to convince owners, business owners and developers to uh, invest in Arlington and invest in uh, the industrial zones. And, you know, when I talk to um, owners and developers, you know, what they're looking for is transportation so their employees can get there easily enough. So uh, I like the fact that you guys zoned us to five zones. I always thought there was four zones. Have we thought about maybe having um, uh, like in the mornings and evenings um, bus routes that, are, that have that um, dedicated uh, path 
we did an experiment over that earlier. Uh, I remember Jenny, you did that uh, on Mass Ave. Can we just do maybe five stops that go to a, a hub somewhere where it may maybe address some of these concerns of having ready transportation? Um, some of the other thing I was looking at is incubator space. I mean, if, if some company's gonna come here and wanna stay here, they wanna grow here. And since all these spaces are so small and chopped up, it's very hard for the company to come here and say, oh, this is the place to be, we're gonna grow here because there's plenty of room and this, so forth. Maybe we say, okay, there's no room, but we're close to schools, we're close to the population that you want to attract. Maybe this is the incubator space and then they can move on once they grow up. I don't know. I mean, I was just thinking all the ways of looking at it. These are all suggestions, by the way. I'm not saying you guys didn't uh, did a good job here. I'm just thinking other things here uh, to add to it. Uh, don't take it in, in, in any other way than uh, what I'm trying to say is it's additive. It's not, um, I'm not just trying to discourage your work. Um, and I like the choices you have. Um, some seem really uh, cost prohibitive and some seem very easily doable. So you give uh, um, the developer and the owner a choice. I think that's good. Um, I'm encouraged to see what more comes out of this. Thank you, Ken. David? Well, ju just to respond to Ken, uh, I, I actually um, think you brought up a, a couple of important suggestions. I mean, the first is really about finding the right balance between the give and take uh, to encourage development, but to get the kind of development that, that we'd like to see here. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we don't have that balance quite right yet, but I like that there are a lot of ideas on the table to to discuss so I, I think that that's worth digging into a little more and make sure we get that balance I agree with um, David. At, a, at a reasonable point um, the other thing it sounded like you were talking about was something like uh, you know private shuttle service like uh, like some of the companies and uh, and uh, and office parks do to like alewife uh, you know that that it that's kind of an interesting idea I, I wonder if we could think about something like that you know because like lexington has their lex express um you know maybe arlington could think about uh, about doing something like that um, to help with the transportation issues since not all of our industrial areas are are uh super convenient uh, from a transportation perspective Great. Before we move to um, public comment, Emily or Eric, was there anything, were there any comments that you've heard from the board that you wanted to address before we move on? There are a couple actually, um, just to confirm on the, some of the things that Jean said at the beginning. Uh, solar hot water, happy to look at the, a different definition of solar ready, um, just to make sure we're not being exclusive of anything. Um, and on the vertical farming, um, uh, we are going to make that specific to food cultivate or food production so that it won't interfere with the marijuana. Jenny had actually brought that up to make sure that uh, we were consistent on that. Um, and you also mentioned the roofs. I have seen images of veg of um, roofs that share vegetation um, and blue roofs. Um, I will double check and see if there's any conflict with solar. Great, thank you very much. Eric, did you have anything else to add before we move to public comment? Um, just quickly on the idea of um, that I think Ken brought up about the incubator space. I, I agree. I think it could be a really interesting, um, maybe sort of a niche for Arlington, because I, I do agree that I'm not sure there's a ton of opportunity, at least in the near term, because of how small a lot of the parcels are in the existing industrial districts, maybe with the exception of one of those. Um, that it might be better to focus on the smaller spaces and sort of growing those companies. And then hopefully they stay here long-term. Um, if they don't, you know, I always say sort of <laughs> what's good, you know, what's good for the region is good for Arlington as well. So we all sort of uh, rise together. Um, so maybe this is Arlington's way of having its, its kind of niche role in the regional economy. It's an interesting concept. Great, thank you very much. 
Um, at this time, we'll open um, the floor up to any members of the public who have any questions um, or, or comments that they would like to propose um, relative to this topic. So if you'd like to speak, please use the raised hand function under the participant button at the bottom of your, your screen. And I'll take comments in the order they're received. Please remember to state your name and your address and you will have uh, up to three minutes. Uh, so first is Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, one of the more interesting uh, points that came out of this study, I thought, was about employment, jobs, in which uh, you noted that I think it was that 93% of Arlington workers actually commute out of town, go elsewhere for their jobs, and the jobs that were actually in Arlington are mostly filled by people who come into town. Um, they don't pay enough that those people can actually live here. And the other point that was related to that was that um, in the industrial zones, you find some of the best paying private sector jobs in town. So this is something that I think we really want to encourage. We don't have much industrial zone left. Um, let's try to maximize its use for high paying jobs so people don't have to drive elsewhere. They don't have to crowd the red line and um, take the T into Cambridge or Boston, that they can walk or bicycle to work right here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Uh, next we have, I see Mr. Warden, you waving your hand, so um, please. Thank you. Uh, is this, am we I can hear here? you. Yep, we can hear you and see you. Good. All right. I can't find any raised hand. I. Uh, That's I fine. I, I was able to see you. Okay. Uh, well, just two comments. Uh, I'm, I'm on the I'm on the zoning bylaw working group, and we've been working with these folks for uh, as described for uh, quite a, quite a long time now, and uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting statistics and, and ideas here. Um, Unfortunately, in the very midst of our, our work uh, for the industrial areas, uh, the Myrex come along and plant a 40B uh, right in the middle of our biggest industrial district. And, and, and that's, and then so various people in town rush to embrace it, say, what a great idea. And a terrible idea. And I, I don't know that we can do very much about it. Uh, I would hope we could, but, but cannibalizing this, this ter terribly small slice uh, of Arlington, as the gentleman pointed out, it's like what 1.2 percent of the pop area, land area, or something, and to start putting more unneeded residential in. It's just an abomination. Um, the other thing uh, I would like to point out again, let, let me mention town meeting. When this the idea of this seventy thousand dollar appropriation for this study was brought up, uh, there was some grumbling. You know, we we already face very high taxes in this town and and every little every few thousand dollars helps or hurts you might say um and the chairman of the finance committee mr tosti at that time uh who, who is um, who's actually look, looking at this proposals these proposals right now um uh spoke to town meeting and persuaded them uh to endorse this study because he said it was so important we have industrial commercial space that we can't afford more people that we cannot have uh residential uses we got to save this space to use for tax productive uses that don't send any children to school. he didn't say don't send any children to schools but that's part of the big cost of, of, of residences but he said we cannot afford more people and in one version of the the, the bylaw Proposed bylaw changes. I saw it said mixed use per in, no, uh, not including residential. Now that has been removed, and there's somewhere there's a footnote. I can't find it. It's in microtype somewhere, but I can't find any of the printed versions I have that says you can have 50% residential in, in a mixed use building. That defeats the entire purpose of, of this study, and it defeats. It's a, totally inimical to to the when the Chairman of the Finance Committee urged the town meeting to approve this. It was the idea that it would be 
non-residential property. And so to come along and put residential in it uh, is just, it, it, again, it, 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 it's, it's, not, it, it's, not, it's not doing what town meeting was told. And I think that all, everybody here has to really pay more attention to what town meeting says, because that is the legislative body. Mr. Warden, you're at time. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next, we have uh, Chris Loretti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. I'd just like to continue where Mr. Warden left off. And I think the problem he's alluding to is that the draft changes to the zoning bylaw delete what is uh, known as um, footnote D to the table of use regulations. And that footnote pertains to mixed use in the industrial zone. And it says that residential is not allowed in the industrial zone. Now, by taking off that footnote, since your board has decided that the table of use regulations for individual uses doesn't matter when you've got a mixed use development and you can put anything you feel like in a mixed use because it says mixed use, that means without that footnote that you can put your typical residential development in the industrial zone with your token amount of a non-residential use. And that is a very big problem. I don't see that anyone in town is going to support that. Now, I, I understand the consultants may not have realized that that's how you have chosen to interpret the bylaw, you know, based on the mis misinterpretation of town council. And I, I suggest you'll probably get shot down in the courts based on the um, Hotel Lexington decision when that comes out. But that's a very big problem and you need to fix it. I suspect you were only, um, or the consultants were only thinking that that residential would be part of these artistic um, work li uh, in living spaces, but the way they've changed it, it opens up a whole can of worms and basically allows the industrial district to become entirely residential, except for this token amount of non-residential in the mixed use developments. And that really needs to be fixed. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. Uh, next up, we have Ralph Wilmer. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Ralph Wilmer. I'm a uh, resident at 17 Walnut Court, and I'm a member of the Zoning Bylaw Working Group. Um, I just wanted to get back to um, some of the discussion earlier about sort of the give and take. Um, I think one of the things that uh, works pretty well with um, what we've seen so far is that the uh, the way the you've been thinking about the draft uh, bylaw changes, it it's not prescriptive, so it allows for developers to choose between several different options uh, in terms of some of the development and site design standards, which I think uh, work well for the areas in which the zoning districts are allowed, and um, and also uh, the go oh, a long way, I think, to promoting some of the sustainable design provisions that we'd like to encourage uh, anyway. So I think it's important to try and keep those provisions uh, in, in the mix. Um, and like I said, I think that uh, it's not as prescriptive as a lot of zoning, a lot of other zoning bylaw provisions that I've seen um, in, in other communities where, where you really don't have that kind of choice. So I'd like to uh, uh, just enforce uh, that concept. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilmer. Uh, before I turn it back over to Jenny and Aaron to talk about next steps, Emily or Eric, did you have any closing thoughts for us? Yes. Yes. Please. Thank you. Um, just to note for the um, two members of the public who spoke on the residential, footnote D is actually, it has been struck out, that is correct, but it's been replaced by footnote E. And footnote E provides additional restrictions on residential. So, um, you know, I understand their concern. We tried to address it by adding this additional footnote, and I urge them to read that. And if they still have questions, um, we'd be happy to discuss more about it uh, through uh, Aaron and Jenny. Great. Thank you very much. So I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Aaron and Jenny to talk about next steps before any final questions from the board. 
Thanks, Rachel. Um, I guess the the next steps that I just wanted to mention is that the zoning bylaw working group will meet again um, during the first week of November. Um, we are their regularly scheduled meeting time is um, Wednesday at eight thirty, being the day after the election. We're looking to reschedule that to um, a date uh, and time later that week, um, to as anticipating a late night. Um, in any event, uh, it would be um, great if the redevelopment board members have any additional or um, specific comments. If um, if uh, that could be uh, sent to Jenny and myself um, by uh, that week, that first week in November, um, by uh, generally um, November 2nd would be um, great but uh, we do have a little leeway and we can present those comments, so specific comments from the redevelopment board to the zoning bylaw working group members during their meeting that week. Um, so uh, if there's other questions, um, you know, in the course of the review, um, I'm happy to discuss with any of the board members um, as needed. Great, thank you, Erin. Do any of the board members have any other questions or comments before we uh, move on to our next item. Jean. I'll just say when I heard David talk about everybody biking to a brewery, all I could think about is like all inebriated people trying to bike home at 10 o'clock at night. On that note, we will <laughs> thank um, Emily and Eric and Aaron for the presentation. Um, really, really wonderful study and thank you so much for sharing with it us sharing it with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, so that uh, closes the presentation uh, agenda item number two. So now we will move on to um, public forum. So anyone who uh, would wishes to speak in the public open forum, you will again have uh, three minutes. Uh, you'll need to state your name and address for the record and please use the uh, raised hand function under the participants section and I will call your name in the order received. So the first is Don Seltzer. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Earlier this week, I requested copies of the uh, new um, document package for the 1500 Mass Ave hearing and I was told that I would have to wait until um, late Thursday to receive them, that it apparently is now the policy of planning department uh, to not issue it before then. Uh, I have two objections to that. One is that if you are serious about wanting public participation in this and feedback, Thursday close of business doesn't leave an awful lot of time for the public to review these plans and um, send something to the board for the upcoming Monday meeting. And the second thing is that it actually states in your own rules and regulations that both the agenda and the document package is supposed to be available and made available to the public on noon by Wednesday um, before the meeting. So uh, I've raised my objection and I hope you'll reconsider this policy um, in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. As I mentioned in my email to you, we'll address that at a future meeting date. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak in the open forum this evening? Seeing none, we will close the open forum. And that concludes our agenda items for today. Uh, Jenny? Thanks, Rachel. Um, if it's okay with the board, I just wanted to make a couple of points. Um, I know this is sort of, I'm referring to a number of things, but I just wanna say a, a few important items, if it's okay, Rachel. Please do. Okay, first, um, the comment that was just raised, I suggest that we talk about the board's rules and regulations, as well as the goals at the goal setting meeting, which I think based upon all of the feedback will be on December 7th. Um, at 5 p.m. I'm sorry, just why did I say December 7th? Uh, December 14th, correct? Was that the date? 
December 14th? We had two that we were looking at. Um, let me just. December 9th, maybe that was the December 9th date. December 9th. Yes. <laughs> you can't do the 14th. Exactly. Okay. December 9th. December 9th is, okay. So that I would, I would like to talk about this topic that at that time. Um, I'm well aware of the timelines of things that need to be done um, and when they need to be done. And they can't always be done in that manner that we originally agreed to when we adopted our board, our, our board rules and regulations. They're actually not really our rules and regulations broadly. It's about Novus agenda rules, which I think only basically maybe one or two of you had a role in adopting back in the day when we first started with Novus agenda. Um, and then we later amended it. Um, I think that after those amendments, it's become very challenging to for on a number of counts, actually. So I'm, I'm actually interested in having that conversation. Um, and not to, so that's what I would like to propose is that that's when we talk about this, if that's all right, in uh, greater James, detail. Uh, five o'clock may be too early for me. I'm not sure. It's, I have to make a few changes then. Okay. Um, I think the other option was 6.30. That I can make for sure, but uh, do you want me to hold on to five for now and just let me see if I can uh, make make a change? I believe that was the preference of most. Yeah. All right, so, so I'll get back to you uh, as soon as I can. If I can okay. move the meeting, I'll move the meeting. Okay, I just want to make one quick point, which is a word that was used earlier, which was grandfathered. I just want to make it clear that that word actually was deemed to have racist origins by the Massachusetts Appeals Court and that the preferred uh, way of referring to land in that manner, land or use, is that it's provided a certain level of protection to all structures that predate applicable zoning re restrictions. So it's that word, if we can choose to not use that word, I would appreciate that. I would also just like to respectfully state that this board is composed of both male, male and female uh, individuals who identify as such. And that every time our public refers to us as gentlemen is extraordinarily disrespectful to the members of this board. And I would hope that in the future that doesn't occur. Um, we also have uh, female staff members who are also participating. So I would like to respectfully request for that to not occur in the future. Um, and then one last thing I want to note is that our master plan very clearly states as a goal that we will provide a variety of housing options for a range of incomes, ages, family, family sizes, and needs. And that every time we hear again and again that housing is not a major element of the master plan is inaccurate. So um, I just wanted to correct that for the record. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, any other items from the board? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. We have a second. Second. Take roll call for uh, the vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. That closes our meeting tonight. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Good night. Good night.